A series of lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And stand by for our forthcoming lecture series, Statistical Mechanics, Introduction to Mechanics, Harmonic Oscillation, and Game Design. Welcome to Lecture 3. Based on material developed in Chapter 1 of my book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. Chapter 1 of the book has three major parts. There's a description of the contents of the rest of the book. We got to that in Lectures 1 and 2. There's a description of classes of models of polymer dynamics and there's a discussion of how those models can be applied to phenomenological studies. There are two sorts of models that we could discuss. We could discuss models that differ in the fundamental forces assumed to control polymer dynamics. We could also discuss, what you see on the view graph in front of you, models that are distinguished by the mathematical forms that they predict. There are two major sorts of models mathematical models that we encounter in polymer dynamics. There are scaling dynamics in which transport coefficients such as the self-diffusion coefficient ds depend on polymer molecular weight m or polymer concentration c as power laws here m to the power gamma c to the power minus x. There are also stretched exponential models. In these models the the transport coefficients, here again the self-diffusion coefficient, d sub s, depend on polymer molecular weight, polymer concentration, through stretched exponentials in those variables. What do I mean by a stretched exponential? Well, you'll note that in the exponential, the variables m and c are raised to powers gamma and nu, and those powers are not integers. Uh, Altenberger and Dollar, in a series of papers on their positive function renormalization group, have discussed how both of these mathematical forms can arise from the same physical model depending on the location of the fixed points in the model. In particular, uh, stretched exponentials arise from fixed points near zero, and scaling models arise from fixed points at other locations not at zero. We could also distinguish between models based on the forces that they assume to have as the dominant force in solution. There are two major forces in polymer solutions. There are hydrodynamic forces which arise because if an object moves with respect to the solvent it sets up a wake in the surrounding solvent and the wake drags along nearby polymer molecules. The wake is also scattered and rescattered and acts on still further molecules. The second force we could note are the excluded volume forces. The excluded volume forces refer to the fact that polymer molecules, colloidal spheres, any atoms in fact, cannot simply pass through each other like ghosts. Excluded volume forces lead to chain crossing constraints. A pol two polymer chains cannot simply pass through each other and keep on going. They must move around each other. The two types of forces are in fact associated with the two sorts of models. Uh, excluded volume forces and chain crossing constraints leading to so-called reputation models are often, often and generally associated with scaling behavior. Hydrodynamic forces assumed to be dominant are often associated with exponential models. It should be emphasized that in each of these models one force is dominant, but the other force is still present. So in a reputation model, the chain crossing constraints are dominant, but hydrodynamic forces contribute to numerical properties of the model, for example, by modifying uh, monomer bead dynamics. Similarly, in hydrodynamic models, 
beads simply still cannot move through each other and excluded volume forces set a minimum distance at which beads can approach each other. Okay, we said there are mathematical models, models that give scaling or stretched exponentials, and there are dynamic models that make assumptions as to which forces in polymer solution are dominant and which force provide corrections. In terms of this book, we are going to emphasize entirely the mathematical models. We test them by taking real measurements and doing functional fits of those models to different functional forms. As a general statement, phenomenological studies do not directly reveal which dynamic models are applicable because in general we can't see the forces directly. We can see things move, we can see them translate or rotate or whatever, but we can't actually directly measure which force is doing what. There is one extremely interesting exception in which, well, we can measure the force and we can determine its range and make certain conclusions from that, conclusions that are quite unfortunate for at least one of the classes of dynamic models. We're trying to describe measurements. How can we advance? One answer is the master curve approach. We start out with measurements of viscosity eta at a series of concentrations C and molecular weights M. We then rescale the viscosity and the concentration. That introduces scaling factors alpha sub eta and alpha sub M that are determined by the polymer molecular weight. When we're done with this approach, we have a single curve, viscosity is a function of scaled concentration, and for polymers of a large series of molecular weights, all of the viscosity measurements lie on a single curve. We're not going to do that. We're going to use the 21st century approach. We're going to fit our measurements to curves. We're going to do nonlinear least squares fitting using the simplex method. You can read about the simplex method in Nagel's book, Physical Chemistry on a Microcomputer. It's really very clear and very well written. The general idea is we take the function, we put in guesses as to the parameters, we calculate the fractional mean square error between the fitting function and the actual measurements. We repeat this for different values of the fitting parameters and then there is a systematic method for finding universal minima. We find the set of fitting parameters that best fit the measurements. Once we've done that we can take the fitting parameters, those scaling exponents and funny exponent constants in the stretched exponential, and we can ask how those constants depend on polymer concentration, polymer molecular weight, or other variables. But that is indeed the process we are going to follow. We're going to use nonlinear least squares. There's an alternative to nonlinear least squares called linear least squares. To use this, you take the original measurements you do some sort of algebraic processing on them, taking logarithms, double, double logarithms, whatever, and you transform the original fitting functions into fitting functions in which the measurements lie on straight lines. This is a terrible idea. The reason it's a terrible idea is that when you beat on the data, to turn the nonlinear function into a linear function where you can do linear least squares fitting, you warp the size of all of the error bars. And now measurements on different parts of your uh, graph have very different size error bars, and your linear least squares process, unless you've been extremely clever and careful, pretends that all the error bars are the same size and gives you totally wrong values of the parameters, and even totally wrong impressions as to what is happening. So having said, we will do nonlinear least squares fitting. What comes next? First of all, we can speak directly to the validity of the different mathematical models. If we take a log-log plot of data versus independent variable and the data all lie on a straight line, 
we can say we are seeing scaling behavior. If the data are not on a straight line, if they lie on a series of smooth curves of particular forms, it may be the case that the data are accurately described by a stretched exponential or a family of stretched exponentials. Those two, by the way, are very easy to tell apart if you have sufficient range and precision of your measurements, namely Scaling laws on a log-log plot actually give you real straight lines, and stretched exponentials on a log-log plot all give you smooth curves. Furthermore, having said we are going to do nonlinear least squares fitting, we can say fit to a stretched exponential like the x minus alpha c to the nu on the slide, and we get out numerical values for alpha and nu for example, for a series of polymers homologous of differing molecular weights. And we can then discuss how alpha and nu depend on polymer molecular weight. The next lecture will present an example of this approach. We'll talk about sedimentation. In a sedimentation experiment, you take a polymer solution, you spin it up in an ultracentrifuge, and you watch the polymer sediment to the bottom or float to the top, depending on its density. There are actually three sorts of sedimentation experiments we'll be talking about. Experiments on binary systems, one solvent, one polymer. Polymer may be dilute or concentrated. Experiments on tracer polymer systems in which we have ternary polymer polymer solvent system. The polymer we're watching, the tracer, is dilute. The other polymer, the matrix, may be dilute or concentrated. And then we'll talk about probe sedimentation measurements in which you measure the sedimentation of a protein, a virus, a polystyrene sphere through a polymer solution. The point of this is to present an example of the sort of analysis done in all of the rest of the book.